today specifically in divorce and remarriage part four and this is i can call it either the what ifs or the what abouts and what ifs and what abouts means basically well let me backtrack a little bit first our first three sessions first session was on uh, background and introduction second session was the teachings of jesus talking about divorce and remarriage and last week part three were the letters of Paul you know, on divorce and remarriage. And again, I really encourage you to go to video.aciw.org and take a look at those because they give you, I'm gonna say the proper context because you can watch this and still get a lot out of it, but it really helps to give you more of the context because Pastor Winger, we're still going to be using, excuse me, the tools that Pastor Winger has graciously developed in the amount of study that he put in there we're still going to be using that but he does a lot of foundational work in those first three parts which is very helpful very helpful for what he's going to cover today in the majority not that we didn't cover what abouts and what ifs in the first three sessions but not as much this one is really now that we have put the structuring in place the foundation in place let's get into the nitty-gritty of okay real life what happens when you have a spouse who's an alcoholic or abusive what happens if there was a divorce but it was not a proper divorce how do what do you deal with remarriage on that so we're going to get into those and other topics today. So this one might be a little bit longer. So strap in, uh, get yourself your Bible out, and let's get ready to not rumble, but study. Study the Word of God. And may the Spirit of God guide us and guide all of us in His Word. Actually, I'm getting to pray right now. Father God, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, Lord, thank you for reminding me. I, I apologize for not remembering to pray before uh, the teachings of the previous session. So, Father, please forgive me. Uh, Lord, Holy Spirit, please illumine our minds and, and anything that is said, whether by myself or Pastor Winger, which is not from you, Lord, please, Holy Spirit, uh, illumine us. Uh, give, it, give us a check in our spirits. Direct us on what is your truth in this very challenging subject, Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're gonna to go to Pastor Winger and I will see you after this last session to just do a little closing uh, comments when we get there. All right, I'll see you in a bit. The new question is this. Let's say that I'm a Christian and I'm married to a Christian. Is there any scenario where I can treat that Christian as a non-Christian. Or I'll put it this way, when can a Christian spouse be treated like a non-Christian and then covered by 1 Corinthians 7, 15? And I think it can happen, and I'm gonna build a case for it now. So can the unbeliever situation be properly applied to other situations, like a believer who abandons their spouse or is unwilling to stay married? And there's a few things I'll point out um, here. One is going to be uh, Dr. Wayne Grudem. Uh, Wayne Grudem recently changed his stance on divorce and remarriage, and he wrote about it in a paper um, called, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the paper. I have it linked below, but it's something like um, uh, Exceptions, Why I Now Believe There's More Than Two uh, About Marriage and Divorce. It's something like that. Man, anyway, it's, it's linked below. You guys can check it out. I, the exact title escapes me, but it gets into a lot of Greek stuff and I'll let you read his paper. I'll say this, that summaries of his paper can actually miss some of the nuance he's actually trying to get at. And when I first heard summaries of it, I thought, nah, that sounds kind of weak. But as you read the paper more carefully and thoughtfully, you realize he's, it's more careful and thoughtful. Basically it goes like this. The phrase, um, in first Corinthians seven fifteen, and I'm going to put it on the screen for you in such cases, this is a Greek phrase and and this might sound like a little deal to people, but it, 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 it's, it's, it's made thoughtfully, is that last word cases is plural, in such cases. And basically, I'm gonna to try to summarize as best I can Dr. Grudem's work here. Um, he says, if, the, if, if Paul wrote in such a case, it would mean only in this exact circumstances, the brother is not enslaved. In the exact circumstance of an unbeliever who's 
going to separate. Then you're not enslaved. You can get remarried, whatever. But Paul wrote in such cases, and that is a different Greek phrase that has specific meaning when you use the plural there. And what it means is that Paul's going to, he's open to extending these this um, instruction to things that are like this. Other situations that you say, yeah, this is kind of like that, right? These are exception, exceptional circumstances. Now, he builds this case pretty strongly. He, he surveys hundreds of years of literature to find every time that this exact phrase in such cases is used in the Greek. And he shows, you know, that it's a category. It's not just an instance. It's not just when an unbeliever leaves, it's rather, or things like that. Um, so my conservative view of it, of it is this. I would not use Wayne Grudem's case to allow for more exceptions by itself. I think it's not enough information by itself. I do, however, think that I have several reasons I'm about to share with you on why you can extend other exceptions into, you know, proper justification for divorce. And I think that Wayne Grudem's case helps strengthen that. It adds weight to this case because, um, well, because what I'm about to share with you right now, and that is that there are clear teachings in the scripture that sometimes believers are to be treated as unbelievers. Uh, whether they're genuine believers or not is irrelevant. They're at least proclaiming they're believers and they're to be treated as if they are unbelievers. And if that's the case, then the 1 Corinthians 7 passage can be applied to a situation where both parties claim to be Christian, but one of them wants to depart and the innocent party can be free from that marriage. And here's the circumstance where that's the case. Matthew chapter 18. Now, in Matthew 18, Jesus talks about a circumstance where a believer can be treated as an unbeliever. And we'll actually start in verse 15. He says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Step one. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. So seek reconciliation, confront them. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So that now you, you, you bring others with you. You bring your friend, you bring your dad, you bring your brother, your sister, you bring uh, their dad or something. You know, you bring other people, now use wisdom, uh, to try to confront them about the sin issues. These are obviously major sin issues. This isn't like they just hurt your feelings. Then verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. So then we get like local body discipline uh, confronting going on. Hey, you've, you've been abusing your wife and we're confronting you and we're going to bring this to you now. Um, in that case, I would actually call the police in addition. But if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So this is a situation of church discipline where a person who is proclaiming they're a Christian because they won't listen to Jesus and they won't listen to the church, they're to be treated as a non-Christian. Paul talks about this as well. In, in an effort to keep this video from becoming 18 hours long, I won't cover it in detail, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the entire chapter is about church discipline and treating a sinning unbeliever who will not repent, who's it's gross sin, it's serious sin, and he will not repent. You are now to treat him as a non-believer. Let me give you one more verse that strengthens this case and it ties it directly to marriage. 1 Timothy 5.8. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for the members of his house, he has denied the faith and he's what? He's worse than an unbeliever. So here we have, I mean, if a guy's doing this and he won't say that uh, the, the husband's starving and will not provide for his own family and then the wife's like going to the church and like, hey, help me, help me here. If he keep, if he won't listen to her, to the body, he's to be treated as an unbeliever. That's the bottom line. So let me, let me break this down, how this actually works in real life. Like, what do you do step by step? Okay. It goes like this. Step one, you have a, you have a Christian spouse who wants a divorce. They claim they're Christian and they want to divorce you. Step one, you deal with your own issues first. You get the plank out of your eye. You do Galatians 6, 1. Um, you know, if anyone's caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, keeping watch on yourselves, lest you to be tempted. So you deal with yourself first. First thing you do is you, you deal with bitterness, anger, resentment, um, desire for harm or malice towards the other person. You deal with all that stuff between you and the Lord and you can come, uh, you open and honest and repentant if you've been contributing sin into the situation. That's your first step. Step two, you work with your spouse. You go to them. Hey, let's work on this. Hey, let's, I, I want to offer, offer forgiveness for this, but I, I need to see, I need to see you making differences, making changes. You know, um, I want to stay married. I want to stay together. 
and you try to work with your spouse. Step three, it won't work. You bring in one or two others, Christians, to try to help bring the pressure of Christian, um, Christian commitment to them. If that doesn't work, you involve the local church, step four. If that doesn't work, leaders agree, he is to be, or she is to be treated as an unbeliever, and now 1 Corinthians 7.15 applies. They're beyond Jesus' lordship, beyond the church's influence, major attempts at reconciliation have been made, they want a divorce, they can divorce you, and you are now free to marry another. I think that's a consistent interpretation of scripture. Does this conflict with 1 Corinthians 7, verses 10 and 11? If we look at those before, some would say there's a, a conflict I'm creating here. He says, to the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. Uh, no, actually here in 1 Corinthians 7, 10 and 11, it's the husband and the wife who are being given instructions. But what if they don't listen? What if the wife who's separated won't listen? The husband who's leaving his wife won't listen? Well, then they can eventually be treated as an unbeliever and be covered by 715. What do you do if the local church won't help you? You can't, they won't do church discipline. They won't get involved or they won't listen. I think you, you, you do the best you can. You try to take those steps and you do the best you can. You walk with wisdom, get counsel, and you may still end up having to treat them as an unbeliever, depending on the scenario. Um, how much time has to go by? I'm not going to answer that question. Um, how much time has to go by before you could look at getting remarried or look at building another relationship? I, I don't know how to answer that question. Every situation is so different. So uh, God give you wisdom. And... What if you want to wait? What if they've left you, but you're like, I just want to stay single and wait, and I'm hoping for restoration. Then God bless you. That's a great thing. Go for it. You're not enslaved, though. That's your choice. You're not enslaved. It's a choice you're making. It's not being forced upon you. I just wouldn't put it as a requirement. So this leads us to principle 12 in our long list of principles, biblical principles. The rule for unbelievers can be applied to proclaimed believers if they can be biblically treated as unbelievers. This doesn't mean they are unbelievers, it means that we're allowed to treat them as such. I think this is good Bible study, in my opinion. So let me go to the next question. The next question is this, and we're going to hit the whatabouts now, okay? I've, <clears throat> I've, uh, I'll still have more in 1 Corinthians 7, but we're going to start to really nuts and bolts now. We've covered so much theology and so much scripture and historical insights and Greek stuff. Now we're going to ask about life, right? Practical life application. What about abuse or extreme situations? First, let me say this. The answer I'm giving right now does not apply in most situations. It doesn't apply to most marriages. Please guard your heart. It's easy to fake that you're abused or to get a victim mentality where you, after you've decided you want a divorce, all of a sudden you have this radically distorted, you know, retelling of the story and, um, we don't want to do that, right? And, and, but I can't control that. I'm, I, I also don't want to victimize the abused to avoid people doing that, so I'm not going to do that. We are called as Christians to turn the other cheek, to forgive 70 times 7, to, to be gracious and, and loving and kind and to just go the extra mile. But we are not called to just sit there and stay in a marriage of abuse. My 13th principle, and I'm going to tell you the principle first this time, and then I'll give you biblical reasons for it. Radical danger or harm justifies separation and divorce. Radical danger or harm. It justifies not only separation, but also divorce. Now, I'm going to give you a number of examples in the scripture and then show you how to apply that to divorce. Examples where any kind of radical harm or danger, it justifies, generally speaking, breaking rules. So um, I know that sounds, this is, this is potentially abused, what I'm about to tell you, but I think it's very true. Um, let's go to Matthew 12, verse 3. <clears throat> Jesus, you know, we know the rule of the Old Testament. Like, you, you, maybe you know this, right? You, you don't eat the showbread. The showbread is for the temple and it's for the priests. Only, the, only they can eat it. But in Matthew 12, 3, Jesus says something where there was an exception to that rule. And he says, have you not read when David, what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and he ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who are with him, but only for the priests. So the principle seems to be, well, David's life is in danger. He's being chased by Saul. He needs food to continue on his journey and save his own life. 
and Jesus seems to be approving of his eating of the showbread, but there's a law against it because this is an exception to that law. There's a lot of other examples of these types of things. Matthew 12, verses 5 through 7. We'll just scroll down a bit. Jesus talks about this and the Sabbath. Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath, the priests of the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless, right? Because they're laboring in the temple on the Sabbath. This is interesting, isn't it? Wait, they profane, but they're guiltless? And then he goes on to explain the principle they didn't understand. He says, I tell you something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless for the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. When a woman or, or, or husband, it does, it's not as often common, but it does happen. When a woman leaves or flees or a guy because of abuse of themselves or of the children, and they have to get out of Dodge, to tell them that they are required to stay faithful to that marriage and to not divorce and to stick with that person, I think it condemns the guiltless. And I think that it's violating the God desires mercy and not sacrifice principle. So if you're saving someone or you're healing life, like when, let me give you another example here. Um, same chapter, Matthew 12, verses 11 and 12. Violating the Sabbath, so to speak, in, in, in a, at least their view of the Sabbath, their overly strict view of the Sabbath, just like some people's overly strict view of marriage. Matthew 12, 11, it says, um, which one of you has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will take hold of it and lift it out? And of course they would. They would all have done that. And then he goes on to say, of how much more value is the man than the sheep? So it is, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Yeah, yeah, don't work on the Sabbath, but you can do good on the Sabbath. There's some great good deed that needs to be done. Well, it is good to encourage a, a woman to depart from a seriously abusive situation or a man or, ch or kids for that matter. That's a general good. So unless you're saving or healing life, right, then you, can, then you have a new exception. The exception here is about human life and um, human health. And that's what the abuse issue is all about. Uh, can someone depart a marriage when there's abuse like that going on. There's more examples. Um, we've already talked about some of these, right? But in Luke 18, Jesus is like, hey, honor your father and mother. But in Luke 14, he's like, you have to hate your father and mother. Well, he doesn't mean actually hate, but he's like saying, yeah, it would be perceived as dishonoring them. But the greater rule is following me, not them. We're to obey government, but in Acts, they disobey the government and they keep preaching Jesus anyways, because there's a, there's a general rule, obey the government, but there are exceptions to that rule that are appropriate. You're not to eat unclean food in the scripture, but Ezekiel, he was directly told to eat unclean food by God. So, I mean, if you have a direct instruction, then you follow that. You're not to fail gather, gathering on the Sabbath in the Old Testament, but if you're ceremonially unclean, you can't gather on the Sabbath. So there's an exception to a rule. You're to respect your husband, right? Except if, you know, if your husband's plotting to murder somebody, you would, you would naturally go against that. Um, Abigail in the story of Nabal, she seems to disrespect and go behind her husband's back, but she's she's lauded for it. She actually saves his life and the lives of her servants by doing it. And so saving life seems to be a general exception to lots of rules. Um, there's all kinds of other stuff we could look at. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of other examples I could give. You're to turn the other cheek and take up the cross, but Jesus also says in Matthew 10, 23, if they persecute you, flee. Well, that's not exactly turning the other cheek. Yeah, but that's because you got to have some wisdom here. That's why. And again, finally, to get to where we are today, you're not to divorce except for adultery. I would say, unless essential health is at risk. After all, this is the commonality among so many examples of exceptions to the rule in the Bible and from the mouth of Jesus. It alone doesn't answer all the questions, but there's a principle that we can say, we can obey this principle with wisdom. When life is at stake, when, when serious health concerns are at stake, yes, you can get out of Dodge, you could flee, you could hide, you could do whatever you need to do. Jesus' instruction in the scripture is based on getting the heart of marriage. Therefore, uh, we can evaluate his instruction as a principle about the heart of marriage, not an unbending law that doesn't allow for exceptions. Jesus does this with other issues like the Sabbath. And Paul offers an exception, Jesus offers multiple exceptions. We can extend that to abuse, I think, easily. So, to put it another way, Jesus' similar understanding of exceptions for life or health when understanding the heart of the Sabbath or other laws, it seems to indicate that there's at least room for considering that the same kind of exceptions would exist in Jesus' teaching on the topic of marriage. It's consistent with Jesus. It's consistent with the Old Testament. It's how Jews at the time would have applied it, right? Um, according to Instone Brewer and Craig Keener, 
the Jews of the time would have assumed there were exceptions to any rule that Jesus had given. They would just assume there's other exceptions. And it's consistent with compassion. And probably, perhaps, that's what Paul meant when he says we're not enslaved. We're not talking about making marriage a slavery situation. It's not meant to be that. And so in such cases where marriage is becoming slavery, we are not enslaved. So if you, new question, if you divorce for abuse or extreme situations, can you get remarried? Can you get remarried to someone else? Uh, can we extend from separation to remarriage? Uh, and I think there are several possibilities for this. I'm going to offer them to you. Three. One, we could say that abuse destroys the relationship just like sexual immorality does. And there is, I think there's legitimacy to that, especially if it's sexual abuse. Um, you know, adultery has ruined the, the marriage, has destroyed it fundamentally. And so abuse can fundamentally destroy it. So that may perhaps be one way to validate that. Another thing is that um, if we just get the principle that a justified divorce always allows for remarriage, which seems to be the case in 1 Corinthians 7.15, and even with the words of Jesus, he was arguing against unjustified divorce. And I would say any justified divorce, properly justified, would allow for remarriage. I think that that alone is a strong, uh, a strong case. Another thing we could say to allow people who separated or divorced for abuse to remarry uh, under biblical principles with Christian truth is to say that the abuse of the spouse is the equivalent of the 1 Corinthians 7.15 situation. So reminding you now, 1 Corinthians 7.15, if the unbeliever is not willing to stay with you, then you're not enslaved. You're not bound to the marriage. You're free. How is abuse like that? Well, let me offer you, and it should be obvious, I think, but basically this, the separation that's caused by the abuse is a separation of the marriage that is on, that is the fault of the abuser. In that sense, it's the same as 1 Corinthians 7.15. If this person departs from you, it's on them. They've departed, then you're not enslaved. Well, if they drive you away with abusive behavior and you have to flee, then it's on them. And if they are then unwilling to submit to Christ and repent, submit to the church, then they can be treated as an unbeliever. So they're an unbeliever who's caused the separation between you. To me, it's a similar situation as 1 Corinthians 7.15. So we get principle 14. Any behavior causing proper separation can, if reconciliation is refused by the offender's continued acts, properly lead to divorce because this is, in effect, the same as first, the 1 Corinthians 7.15 scenario. And that's a long one. Um, this means it would lead to divorce and remarriage. That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. All right, now it begins. We're going to get into the topical section of this video. I've covered some topics earlier, but <clears throat> this is just topic after topic. We're going to do all the whatabouts. What about this? What about that? The first one, using the scriptures we covered already and then adding some more were helpful, um, we're going to ask this question, who is Mike Winger to disagree with the church fathers? Um, this is actually a pretty profound question. It's basically said that the early church fathers better understood the New Testament and the words of Jesus and that they unanimously agreed that one could only remarry after the death of a spouse. In other words, adultery does not allow for remarriage. And if, if an unbeliever leaves you or um, abuse, you're driven away because of abuse um, and they won't repent, that you still can't remarry. Um, now, Gordon Winham, who is a huge proponent of the no remarriage view, he depends heavily on the church fathers, very heavily on the church fathers. Uh, to some guys like me, it's really interesting. I care, but they're not scripture, right? These are guys that came later. And anyway, I, I, I wouldn't find myself leaning on this. I know like, like John Piper, who has basically the same view as Gordon Winham, I think, um, maybe not in every particular, but he doesn't depend on the church fathers at all. But Gordon Winham, it's a big, big deal to him. And that's, of course, because John Piper's reformed um, uh, uh, views. Now, First, the question we have to ask is this, is it really true that the, the church fathers were unanimous in saying that only in the case of the death of a spouse could someone marry another person? Well, Origen in the third century, he said the following, quote, some even of the rulers of the church have permitted a woman to remarry even while her husband was still living. Now, Origen was opposed to this view, so he writes like you'd expect. He ridicules that perspective, but it may show at least a break in unanimity. Origen was aware of a number of rulers in the church, leaders, that allowed a woman to remarry while her husband was still living. He doesn't say when or under what conditions, but apparently it wasn't totally unanimous. Ambrosiaster in the 4th century, he taught that desertion by an unbeliever was ground for not only divorce, but for remarriage. Let me read that quote. 
Marriage, <clears throat> this is from Ambrosiaster. Marriage, which is without devotion towards God, is not valid. And therefore, it is not a sin for a person who's divorced on account of God to marry someone else. For the unbeliever in departing, remember they're the unbeliever is the one who left, is seen to sin both against God and against the marriage because he's not been willing to have a marriage ruled by the reverence, by reverence for God. Therefore, marital fidelity need not be maintained. In the case of someone who has departed so as not to accept that the God of the Christians is the author of marriage. So um, he also went on to say that uh, a man could remarry after divorcing a wife for adultery. But Ambrosi Astor said a woman, if she divorced her husband for adultery, she couldn't remarry. Why? Because he wasn't basing his actual teachings exactly off of scripture. Jesus and Paul both applied all the rules equally to men and women. So that's weird, right? And I'm not suggesting we follow Ambrosi Astor. We're just saying, look, here's, here's a guy. Um, in fact, I'll, here's David and Stone Brewer, who has a lot of interesting insights, says this. Although Ambrosiaster was expressing a view that was not preserved earlier, he did not defend himself against detractors. He appeared to believe that this was a perfectly normal exegesis that the reader would accept without much persuasion. Perhaps he represented a sizable minority. So we're not saying that there is there is no um, majority of, of church fathers' views, but rather it's not necessarily unanimous. Epiphany, um, Epiphanius... Epiphanius, in the early 5th century, he allowed for remarriage after divorce for fornication. Let me read a quote from him. He who cannot keep continence after the death of his first wife, or who has separated from his wife for a valid motive as fornication or some other misdeed, if he takes another wife or the wife takes another husband, the divine word does not condemn him nor exclude him from the church or the life but she tolerates it rather on account of his weakness. So he considered it like an, a, con a concession, but it was something that he allowed. And he seemed to be closer to modern views, Ep Epiphanius in that perspective. Augustine, in the early fifth century, he wrote the following. Nor is it clear from scripture whether a man who has left his wife because of adultery, which he is certainly permitted to do so, is himself an adulterer if he marries again. So Augustine at least says, hey, it's not clear to me that a guy who gets remarried or, or probably would apply to a woman um, is an adulterer after, or if, if, if the divorce was caused by adultery itself. So he at least leaves it open for that. Um, David and Stone Brewer summarizes some of the church fathers on this by saying this. Some fathers even discussed the possibility of other grounds for divorce. Origen pointed out that there were other offenses that were more serious than adultery, such as the attempted poisoning of a partner or killing of a child while the partner was absent. He also pointed out that a man may cause a divorce by sexual neglect of his wife. He did not, however, suggest that these should be additional grounds for divorce. He made the surprising decision to leave it to the individual's conscience. Interesting thing on origin there. So I'm not saying there's no majority. There is a majority of, of views, although they, they're not... They don't come to their conclusions the same way. They don't state them the same way. But generally, they're opposed to remarriage after divorce. That's generally true of the church fathers. But it's overstated by people like Gordon Winham in their works. Um, here's the next question we're going to ask about the church fathers. Was the church fathers' view, at least the majority view, was it the result of a proper understanding of the New Testament in Jesus? And, the, you know, Jesus and the apostles. Or... Is it a result of growing asceticism and other unbiblical influences in these men? And I think it's the latter. We do see, for instance, early on in the first <clears throat> in the first century before the church fathers ever show up, because they're not really fathers of the church, right? They're 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 you're 200 years after Jesus. You're not like a father of the church, not really. That's just what we call you for some weird traditional reason. Um, but we do see ungodly attitudes in the first century before these guys ever show up, right? In First Corinthians seven. We see it in three verses, verse 1, verse 28, verse 36, where it was Paul was fighting against attitudes of restricting marriage or even abstaining from sexual relations, relations within marriage. This was a bad thing. Paul's like, don't do that. That's not what you're called to do. And so Paul fights against that. In 1 Corinthians 6, he's fighting against blatant sexual immorality. In 1 Corinthians 7, he's fighting against um, a low view of marriage and a low view of the goodness of sexual relations within marriage. First Timothy 4.3, Paul warns about a false teaching that will come from those who, quote, forbid marriage, that this is a doctrine of demons to be forbidding people to get married. 
In Colossians 2, verse 21 through 23, Paul also warns about ascetic, specifically calls them ascetic, ascetic teachings, which would be these kinds of things like where you devalue marriage or you make um, singleness not just spiritually more useful, but you make marriage like bad, right? And, and that's what was happening. William Heth said the following, responding to um, Gordon Winham on this topic of the church fathers. William Heth said, most of these writers also took a very dim view of sexual relations within marriage, the church fathers. Much like the ascetics Paul confronted in Corinth, in effect, most church fathers said, marital, marital relations are only for begetting children, and even then, you'd better not enjoy it. This was hardly the teaching of Paul. What we're saying is that there seems to have been a beginning point in the first century of weird teachings that we see affecting the church fathers later on. Augustine in the 4th and 5th century, writing in the late 4th, early 5th century, he actually supported chastity during marriage, which Paul clearly refutes in 1 Corinthians 7. Let me read to you what Augustine said and why I don't want to take his advice on when divorce is okay and remarriage. He says, at any rate, husbands and wives are to be regarded as more truly happy if by mutual consent they are able to abstain from all carnal intercourse with each other, whether they do this only after they've procreated children or whether they are foregoing the joy of earthly offspring. They are not disobeying that precept which forbids the dismissal of a wife, for a husband does not put away his wife if he lives with her according to the spirit, but not according to the flesh. Except that marriage is a flesh union, like you take away all of that, you've, you've, you've cut out a really important part of what marriage actually is. Um, uh, Augustine, he actually took Matthew 5.32, where Jesus has his exception clause, to be permission to divorce, but not permission to remarry under any condition except death. And I think that's unsustainable. Now, we see, let me summarize here, right? we see in the first century, when the letters of the, the epistles of Paul are written, there's already asceticism that he's fighting against and this sort of low view of marriage. And um, then we see it developing in the church fathers when they say things that clearly contradict what scripture teaches on the topic of marriage. We also see the trajectory later on go down the road a few hundred years, and we see the results of that trajectory in the Roman Catholic Church requiring celibacy among spiritual leaders or priests can't even get married. And I know there's uh, different rites and all that kind of thing, but there is a rule uh, in the Roman Catholic Church about priests having to be single. And that's a pretty big deal uh, <clears throat> and completely unbiblical. So we even go f further than that. Let me give you an example of some writers in the Church Fathers. This is, again, this is why I'm not going to let the Church Fathers tell me what to think on this topic. Um, I, I care about what they say, but they clearly conflict with Scripture on the very issue that we're talking about. So I don't have to um, take them over what seems to be the clear teaching of, of the text. So some of the Church Fathers, they actually refused to allow remarriage even if your spouse died, which... How can, you, how can you argue that, right? Romans 7, 1 Corinthians 7. How can you argue that you're not free if they die? Athenagoras, Tertullian, and Clement of Alexandria did this. I'll quote a couple of them here. Athenagoras, in 177 AD, that's really early. He said the following. For he who deprives himself of his first wife, even though she be dead, is a cloaked adulterer resisting the hand of God and dissolving the strictest union of flesh with flesh. Athenagoras taught that even if your spouse died, you couldn't get remarried. This is completely contradicts the Bible. And it was second century. This is very early. Tertullian in the uh, third century, early third century, writing around 211 to 215. Now he, he conflicts with himself. Tertullian early on, he discourages remarriage after the death of a spouse, but he allows it. But later on, he goes more strict. And he says this, um, therefore, if those whom God has conjoined man shall not separate by divorce, it is equally congruous that those whom God has separated by death, man is not to conjoin by marriage. The joining of the separation will be just as contrary to God's will as would have been the separation of the conjunction. In other words, he would take it as a sign, if your spouse died, as a sign that God was, was purposely making you single and wanted you to stay single forever. Now, Paul, when he writes... Uh, in, in the pastoral epistles, he actually says, if the widows are young, they ought to get married. Like this is, did Tertullian care that Paul said this? I don't know. I don't have to figure out what's going on with Tertullian and his wacky head in this particular situation. I can just say he's not representing a clear understanding of scripture. He's got other influences and those are influences I don't want. Finally, 
The church fathers, by and large, seem ignorant of the Jewish debate that was going on between the Hillelites and the Shimeites. And that, that gives us the backdrop of Jesus is saying and helps us understand why there are more exceptions than what they realize. Um, everybody pretty much agrees with, with that. So that's why the early church fathers um, having a unanimity on the topic is not that impressive to me. The unanimity isn't quite as strong as people, people point it out to be. But also their actual teaching is not based on scripture. Uh, in many cases, it's based upon other things and disagrees with clear teachings of scripture. Let's do another what about. What about this? Malachi 2.16, God says, I hate divorce. Doesn't that mean you can't get divorced? Like, isn't that all the information you need? Malachi 2.16, since I didn't cover this passage, I thought I should talk about it here. For the man who does not love his wife, but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. Now, what you'll notice here is that this is the verse that says, that, you know, God hates divorce, but it doesn't have the phrase God hates divorce. Well, here's the New King James Version, and many versions put it this way, right? God hates divorce. The problem is that in the Hebrew, the phrase hate isn't he, God hates divorce, but it, it, it doesn't seem like God is the one who's doing the hating. And this, just so you know, one scholar said, this is literally the hardest verse in the Bible to, to translate because the Hebrew construction is just really difficult to deal with. The ESV translates it in a way that, now I'm not, I shouldn't be the one deciding how it should be translated, but at least from what I've read and studied and I've spent hours and hours on just Malachi 2.16, I'm inclined to think the ESV got it right. The hate is being done by the husband, right? The man who does not love his wife, but divorces her. Um, the idea of hate and divorce are coupled a lot in ancient Near Eastern texts. The man he hated and divorced, he hated and divorced. Even in Deuteronomy 24, the man hated and divorced. And so hate seems to mean unjustified divorce. And that may be exactly what Malachi 2.16 is saying. That you divorced her because you didn't love her. Lack of love on your part was the reason for your divorce. And that may be actually what God's speaking about. But at any rate, even if you take uh, the more common understanding of Malachi 2.16, that God hates divorce, I would say that I agree. God does hate divorce. Does that mean that all divorce under all circumstances is invalid? Well, then how did God divorce Israel? That We have lots of reasons we've already given to reject that. It would just be a general truth. God hates divorce. It would not necessarily mean all divorces are therefore wrong. Um, nor could it mean that if you're going to take all of scripture. What about those who will abuse the exceptions that I'm giving and wrongly divorce? What about those who will abuse those exceptions and wrongly divorce? Uh, I'll be really frank with you. I totally am worried about this myself. As I teach on this topic, I'm thinking probably more people will take this data and abuse it, misuse it to justify their own desire for a divorce than the number of people that will take it and use it properly because they ought to get a divorce and it's right. That grieves my heart. The truth is, there is no way for me to teach this in a way that it won't be abused by people who will follow their hearts wherever they want. There's just no way to do it. But I'm not going to victimize everyone else in order to prevent those people from doing what they're going to do anyways. They're going to do it with or without justification. They're going to find the teacher and the leader and the pastor and the thing to tell them the thing they want to hear so they can do the thing they want to do. And, and, and that's on them, not me. Um, you should ask yourself this. Have I truly done everything I can to restore this marriage? Have I truly dealt with my own issues first? And I say, please see my videos specifically to the husband and specifically to the wife in the video description and consider that. This is really big. If you're blind to your own issues and you magnify their issues, of course you think everything you do is justified. Do you want a way out or would you prefer to have restoration? Um, it will help you see if you're judging carefully, if you're, if you're abusing this rule or if you're... Um, if you have a really justified divorce right now, do you want a way out? Or if you had the option to restore, boy, they repent and you guys restore the relationship, would you be like, yes, I want that? If your answer is no, no, I hope they don't. There's a hard issue to pray through before you make a decision. It's likely that most people who think they're an exception are not. It's quite possible. Um, it's just my opinion, but uh, I do think it's true. I, I've talked to women who've divorced a husband and uh, said, God told me to divorce them. And I look at the situation and I go, I really don't believe that. But they say, I'm, I'm at peace. I'm at peace. And But you look at their life and you go, oh, you're obviously not. Like, I'm sorry. That happens a lot. 
that happens a lot. But I've also seen other things. I've seen restoration. I've seen people have their lives restored. And I've seen there's some women who, especially women, to be honest, but men too, who get freed from an enslaved relationship because of the freedoms that we get in these principles that we're learning here today. So yeah, I'm, I'm worried about abuses too. Uh, what about alcoholism, gambling, drug use? How do we apply these principles to that? Al alcoholism, gambling, drug use? I think the question is how bad is it? It's honestly, if your, your husband's an alcoholic, that doesn't mean you can divorce him automatically. Is it dangerous to life or health? Is there significant you know, scenario going on? It would have to be kind of extreme, but I, I just wanna say, how bad is it? What's really going on? Um, the gambling is, it's costing us our livelihood. We're losing our home. Okay, well, this is a health and safety concern, right? And so there may be a reason to be separating from him, get your own bank account, that kind of thing. These things, uh, every situation is unique. Drug use, uh, the question is, you know, how bad is it and how, what impact is it having on our lives? And I think that you should go through that process. Check yourself first, seek restoration, rebuke, bring other believers. If you have to separate and then they still will not repent and you can treat them as an unbeliever, then a divorce can be justified. What about a marriage that was entered sinfully? Should you break up a marriage if, you, if you're in a marriage right now and you're like, I shouldn't have got married to that person, that was an immoral act. I think your answer is no, you should not stop that marriage, you shouldn't break it up. It might have been wrong to do, but guess what it is? It's a marriage. It's a marriage. And to divorce now <laughs> in the name of the holiness of your first marriage, to divorce the second one, it, it's contradictory. And I'll give you a few of the reasons for this. Um, um, Jesus and with the woman at the well, he affirmed that her, her five previous husbands were in fact husbands. She's had five husbands. So he, he seems to affirm, again, I mentioned this before, the legitimacy of second, third, fourth, and even fifth marriages. He seems to affirm that. Jesus, again, when he talked about not getting divorced, he says, let not man, you know, take, take apart, separate what God has joined together. He didn't say cannot. It cannot happen. Um, he acknowledged that marrying another was an actual possibility. If you marry another, you commit adultery. Like It's actually marriage, though. Like That's the word he used for it. Uh, everybody would assume that it was a real marriage. Another point I want to mention, and I think this is actually pretty significant, is that we would actually expect the Bible to have to break up lots of marriages if this was the if this was the teaching, right? When Paul's bringing his radical teachings about marriage into 1 Corinthians 7, why doesn't he say, if you're in the middle of a second marriage and your first spouse is still alive, separate and go be reconciled with them? He never says that. His instruction to whoever you're married to is to just stay married. So where we would expect Paul to mention it, he doesn't. And his instructions on face value would tell you in your second, third, fourth, fifth marriage to just stay married. I think silence in Paul gives weight to accepting those marriages. In the Old Testament, second marriages were seen as legitimate, Deuteronomy 24. Um, wrongful oaths were still binding. This is an interesting point. Uh, John Piper actually brings this up. Joshua made a wrongful treaty with the Gibeonites, but God still called him to honor the treaty. This is in Joshua 9. The bottom line is this. It's a covenant God said not to make, but God required them to keep it after they made it. That is a wrongful marriage. It was wrong for you to do that. That was even an adulterous act when you got married. But guess what? You're married. Now honor that covenant and now, now um, redeem it in the Lord. Now, David Pawson, um, I want to mention by name because his teaching is both in video form and in book form. And I've, I've checked out both of them, read his book and everything. He teaches that if you have divorced and remarried and you are still in the second marriage and your first spouse is still alive, you are not only uh, existing in a marriage you shouldn't have, you are in active, constant adultery every day of your life and you are not going to heaven when you die. Like you will go to hell because of this, this rebellion against God. This is David Pawson's teaching. It's extreme. And I was like shocked when I heard it. Um, so he argues marriage is not only an adulterous act initially, but it remains continual adultery for the duration of the marriage. How does he do this? He bases it off of a verb tense in Luke 16, 18. Let's walk through it. He, uh, here it says, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Now, according to David Pawson, according to him, um, I'll just read it to you. This is on page 43 of his book, Remarriage is Adultery Unless. 
And he says, um, furthermore, the tense of the verb for committing adultery is the present continuous, which means to go on doing something. Some have tried to say that the only the initial act of remarriage and its first physical union is adultery, but Jesus is including all subsequent intercourse. To put it bluntly, remarriage after divorce is bigamy in God's eyes. Um, this is the strongest possible terms. Uh, David Poston talks about a man he met who was in a second marriage and asked him about it. And he told the man he had to pick between heaven and that second marriage because he couldn't have both. Um, this to me is, is I, I love his piety, his, his commitment to the Lord, but it's just, it's just wrong. And I think God, it's wrong. Um, but at any rate, let's talk about this. Um, Pawson says that the Greek word for commits adultery is in the present continuous Greek. Now this is, I don't know how well David Pawson knows Greek, um, but present continuous is probably the wrong description. A better description is present. We all agree it's present, right? But it's the, the mood of the of the term when you're when you're parsing out a greek verb the mood of the term is indicative not continuous indicative is not the same as continuous and i'll give you some reasons to think why that's the case um generally speaking when a greek verb is used in the present indicative sense as it is here in luke 16 18 it does not mean that the action is going on into the future forever and always that's not the case Robertson, who, um, in fact, I have an article in the description below you can read on this whole topic. I'm just going to give you one quote and then we'll move on. But Robertson notes that the most frequent use of the present indicative is in the descriptive present, the simple statement of fact with no specific reference to continuity. The iterative present, which is what Pawson wants to suggest it is, involving repetition is not so frequent. Um, there's an article get gets into great detail on this. It's actually way too complicated for this 12... 13 hour long video I'm doing to add that as well. But the article is down there. The reality is that um, present indicative is not enough to say that the future marriage is a continual act of adultery. You need additional arguments for that in the text. And they give examples of text that don't even make sense when you think that's what the present indicative means. So I, anyway, I encourage you to check that out. Um, David Pawson is, is way out on a limb in his declaration that people are not saved if they have a second marriage. Here's my view for what it's worth. The second marriage, if it was an unjustified remarriage, if it was an adulterous act, then it breaks the first marriage finally. Um, this is actually consistent with Deuteronomy 24. The woman couldn't go back to the first husband after the second one, right? That there is a breaking of that marriage. You have divorce with adultery now. And so now the new marriage takes precedence. It is a marriage. Even if it started wrong, it's a marriage and it should be preserved. I thought that would actually be pretty important for me to cover David Instone Brewer's work by itself in this survey, since I'm not actually agreeing with his case and using it, but it is a very impactful work. Um, his book, Divorce and Remarriage in the Bible, The so Social and Literary Context, that's the name of his book. It came out in 2002 and it's having a huge impact. There's a lot of people that are on board with David Instone Brewer's view. I spent a lot of time, I mean, so many hours looking at his work and reading reviews and scholarly papers and all this kind of stuff to try to figure out if I shared that view or not. In the end, I find that he has tons of great insights and I did use many of his insights and his access to primary sources that he gives you is really good, but I don't agree with his central argument. And so for that reason, um, you may just wanna skip this section, that's fine. Uh, there's a video map down below as I've mentioned several times, but. This is my response to David and Stone Brewer's work in particular. Um, <clears throat> forgive me if I don't uh, give it the rigor that it deserves. Uh, I'm certainly trying. And the thing is, his, his case is long and drawn out, and I'm trying to summarize it, which is always a challenge. But basically, David and Stone Brewer, his case is like a five-link chain. And if every link in the chain is intact, then his conclusion works. But if any of the links aren't intact. If any one of the links fails, then his conclusion also fails. And we can still find exceptions, but we don't find them the way he does. And that would be that would be my view. Uh, <clears throat> so let me give you the five links. And then we'll talk about after that after I make his case, so you can understand it, then we'll talk about issues with those links. It's based on Exodus chapter 21, verses 10 and 11. In Stone Brewer, his actual argument goes something like this. 
that Exodus 21 verses 10 and 11, it gives three additional grounds for divorce beyond sexual immorality. Um, now, I've argued for grounds like extreme ab abuse, driving your spouse away. Those were all grounds for, for um, uh, divorce. But David and Stone Brewer is going to use these two verses to establish additional grounds. So he says, if uh, the scripture says here, if he takes another wife to himself, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, or her marital rights. Those three things, food, clothing, and marital rights. And if he does not do these three things for her, she shall go out for nothing without payment of money. This is speaking here about a servant, a, a, a woman who is a servant, who's a hired servant. And, but she's been married to the man. So she's elevated to the role of wife. Well, he marries a second wife if he diminishes, she has a she has a case for divorce if he gets rid of her food, clothing, or marital rights. Um, David makes a case for this being material needs, food and clothing, and marital rights referring to emotional neglect, including um, sexual neglect. So that's his first link. Um, he's going to say that then the Jews of Jesus's time, they would take this Exodus 21 and they would interpret it this way. Hey, if the slave woman can go free for those three reasons, then certainly the free woman can. Hey, if a free woman can go free, then certainly a man can go free. And this is what David calls, a, a Dr. Instone Brewer calls it the argument from the lesser to the greater. And he says the rabbis would have all viewed it this way. And it's like when Paul says, you don't muzzle, if you don't muzzle an ox, then you don't starve the minister of the gospel. It's like arguing from the lesser to the greater. Hey, if, if it's true of a slave woman, if she has these rights, then certainly everybody does. Now he's gonna say that all the Jews, his second link in the chain, all the Jews believe this, especially and particularly, and most importantly, the school of Shemai. The Shemaiites in the debate with the Hillelites, they thought that not only sexual immorality or unchastity was grounds for divorce, but so was lack of material or emotional sexual um, uh, treatment of your spouse. His third link in the chain, is this, and all these links are, I think are essential for his case to get through. <clears throat> his third link is that in the recorded debates in the Mishnah, the debate I put up earlier for you between the Hillelites and the Shimeites, I'm gonna go ahead and bring it up again. That's not it. Um, <clears throat> they don't talk about these other, these other reasons for divorce. They don't even mention them. And the reason why, um, you know, those three things, basically material or emotional neglect, marital neglect, that those things are not included in this debate is because they all were assumed. The, the, the Shemaites assumed them, the Hillelites assumed them. And because, and then this is, they're just debating Deuteronomy 24, right? They're not talking about what they already agree on. Then the fourth link in the chain, number four, is that if the school of Shemai allowed for divorce for Exodus 21, then Jesus, who sounds a lot like them, probably did too. So then we have Jesus, it's just assumed because of his culture and time that he also held those views. Then the fifth link in the chain, the final chain, which it does have to have every link, is that um, Instone Brewer is going to go through all the different texts in the New Testament to try to read them and to conform them with the idea that everyone reading and writing these texts is assuming that uh, material or emotional neglect is grounds for divorce. So as far as my analysis, to the best of my ability, um, having spent a lot of time on the topic, I think that there are problems with link number two, link number four, and link number five with David and Stone Brewer's case. Let me just walk through them real quick. Uh, link number two is the question, do the Shimeites really hold, the, the school of Shimei, do they really hold to these tw Exodus 21-based exceptions? And I think here, the problem with the, the link here is that there's just insufficient data. On my reading of David and Stone Brewer's book, it seems like we have enough reason to question this. I'll give you three points on that. Um, one, though it's Though it seems that many Jews did use those things from Exodus 21, they used those types of, types of things as justification for divorce, it isn't clear that the school of Shemai held that view. We Number two, info from the Mishnah that we do have about marriage and divorce is often hard to trace back to the early first century and even harder to put into the opinions of the school of Shemai. Much of the stuff in the Mishnah comes from after 70 AD, and according to Instone Brewer, by that time, the school of Shemai was, quote, all but wiped out. So it's not enough to say in the Mishnah they use Exodus 21 exceptions for divorce, um, and therefore the school of Shemai held that view. In reality, in the Mishnah, they, them saying that doesn't put it on the lips of the school of Shemai unless in the Mishnah it says, the school of Shemai says, dot, dot, dot. 
and that leads to the third problem with link number two, which is this, the actual quotes from the school of Shemai in, in Stone Brewer's book and in the Talmud. And I read big chunks of the Talmud to kind of help me come to this conclusion. They don't give us reason to think that they actually held to Exodus 21 based exceptions. I'm not saying they absolutely didn't, but it doesn't give us grounds for saying they did hold those views. When you read about Shemai, specifically his school, I don't get that. Um, and I'm not the only one who said this. One of the scholars who was reviewing David and Stone Brewer's work actually pointed this out. And, and um, I made the mistake of not, I read so many reviews of his stuff. I made the mistake of not saving that one in particular. But they pointed out the same thing. They said, look, you know, you're, you're reading too much into the school of Shemai. We can't affirm link two very confidently that the Shemites really held to these Exodus 21 based exceptions. Um, now that maybe I'm wrong there. That's my current position on that view. Um, if I'm wrong, this doesn't change my case against him. Stone Brewer that much against his case, <laughs> not him personally. Seems like a great guy. Um, the fourth link and one that I have an exception with is does Jesus really side with the Shemites in such a way as to make us think he agrees with their other views that he's not talking about? So let's suppose the Shemites did think these Exodus 21 exceptions were a thing. Does Jesus side with them in such a way to think Jesus agrees with that too? And here I'm going to say, I don't think so. I think the answer is no. Jesus actually disagrees with Shemai in some important areas. For one, he doesn't think um, any matter divorces, the Hillelite any matter divorce, that those are valid even if achieved by a court. This is not a, a Shemaiite view at all. He's like, look, you, you know, the Shemaiites, according to Instone Brewer, would, would marry someone who was divorced through a Hillelite school or Hillelite court. But this is not the case with Jesus. He's like, hey, you know, you're, you, you were divorced wrongly. Your remarriage is adultery. That's not something that the, the Shemaites would have agreed with, it seems. Um, two, Jesus doesn't appeal to Deuteronomy or Exodus to establish his principle. What we're doing is we're saying that, hey, um, in, the, in another passage in the law of Moses, there's more justifications for adultery. So then Jesus would have affirmed that or for adultery, for divorce and remarriage, excuse me. Uh, but Jesus actually sidesteps the issue of what Moses permitted. And he gives us a priority of Genesis 1 and 2, showing that the permission in Deuteronomy 24 was not a justification. I think that we can project Jesus' statement about Deuteronomy to Exodus 21. It seems that it was, even if it was permission in Exodus 21, it doesn't mean it's justification. So it seems wrong to base exceptions on rabbinic use of Exodus passages when Jesus comes against using the law of Moses as justification for divorce in the first place. If we assume Jesus is consistent, he might respond to Exodus 21 the same way he responded to Deuteronomy 24. If, if in my, as in my view, he's not interpreting Deuteronomy 24, he's just offering a ruling of his own um, that is based upon maybe God having divorced Israel for adultery. Um, if that's the case, then he's, it's not based upon how we interpret Exodus 21 or Deuteronomy 24. That's, that's not to say that Jesus's rule can't have any exceptions at all. That's not what I'm saying. Obviously, I've given several. It's just that we don't get them by importing Exodus 21 into the background of Jesus' statements and opinions. And then finally, the last link that I would disagree with David and Stone Brewer on is link five. The link five, the idea that you take this view and read it consistently with the, the, the statements of the New Testament by saying, oh, in the background, they're affirming, you know, extra three more reasons for divorce that they're not mentioning and their specific reasons. I, I don't think that that's the case. So this is the same reason, by the way, I reject the no remarriage view. I don't think you can marry it with scripture very well. Let me give you one example from uh, in Stone Brewer's book. So his treatment of first Corinthians chapter seven, verse three, I'm going to read it to you now. Hold on. I'll put the verse up for you first. Keep in mind, for his final link to work, he has to take this all this theory about Jesus and then say, and when you read the New Testament text, you know, even if it's not explicit in there, at least it won't conflict with what I'm saying. Um, well, I think, unfortunately, I think it does. Um, but 1 Corinthians 7.3 shows that there's just not a very good handling, I think, of the text in this case, at this later stage of him developing his argument. 1 Corinthians 7.3 says, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. Now, let me quote David Instone Brewer from his book. He says, This present study and a few others have also pointed out the affirmation of the grounds for divorce in Exodus 21, 10 through 11 by the use of that text in 1 Corinthians 7, 3. Now, here's where, you, where I, I, get, I get lost. Um, I don't think that Paul is using Exodus 21 in 1 Corinthians 7, 3. It does say the wife should give 
you know, we should give each other our conjugal rights. It does say that. And that's and that concept is in Exodus 21. That's true. But is he using Exodus 21? Not only that, David and Stone Brewer doesn't just say there's a connection between 1 Corinthians 7, 3 and Exodus 21. He says um, that he's pointing out, quote, the affirmation of the grounds for divorce in Exodus 21. So he's taking 1 Corinthians 7, 3 as kind of like a way of saying, see, and you can divorce if they don't give you your conjugal rights. And I don't think that that fits 1 Corinthians 7 at all. It seems like total eisegesis to me. So this is a really crucial point, and it's under-supported in David and Stone Brewer's case. I think that the fifth link doesn't doesn't actually work. Um, yeah. Now, let me offer a caveat. I do think it's um, dangerous that dangerous neglect of material needs or extreme emotional abuse can be grounds for divorce. I just don't use David and Stone Brewer's theory to get there. That's not my way of getting there. And when he gets there, he gets there with a lot more flexibility in when you can divorce than, than I would. So there's my quick, I mean, all that took a little bit, but it's actually my very quick analysis of his stuff. There's so much more in every issue. And it's actually a fascinating book. And I've linked it below and you guys can check it out if you like. Next question. Should a pastor marry someone who's wrongly divorced? Um, as a pastor, I think that the right answer is no. Uh, I think you should not marry someone who is who is wrongly divorced. Now, maybe they were wrongly divorced and then subsequent things have happened in the intermediate period where now the divorce is like legitimate, uh, morally legitimate. That's one thing. But I mean, who's currently wrongly divorced? Um, I think the answer is absolutely not. I think that our calling for them is that they get rid of any other relationships. They get their life right with the Lord in every way. And then they try to seek for restoration if possible, if it was an invalid divorce reason. They're still morally obligated to their spouse. That was one of our first principles. Also, there's a huge danger. Christian, you're thinking about marrying somebody who was unjustifiably divorced and choosing now to marry another person. Like you're probably going to divorce them too, or they'll divorce you. The same unresolved issues that have them rooted in bitterness and unforgiveness with their previous spouse are going to crop up in your marriage, almost guaranteed. Now, this is a real dangerous situation. Um, if there's been repentance and honest attempts to restore and the other person will not allow for restoration, then they're in the 1 Corinthians 7.15 situation, then okay, they may now, they're free and they may now get married. And of course, as a pastor, there's a concern that someone's just lying to me. What if they're tricking me and they don't have justified divorce? Um, I, I mean... I'm not a cop. I'm not just going to assume everyone's guilty to prove their guilt. Like that's an interrogation technique. Like I'm not, like, as a pastor, that's not really the right direction to go. Um, that deceit is on them, not on you as a pastor. So if you have reason to think that, you know, the, the divorce is legitimate, then you can do the marriage, in my opinion, for what it's worth. Um, now, what I want to do is a quick summary of all of the 15 biblical principles, and then I want to add principle 16 to it. So here are all of them on the screen. I'm just going to read through them because, boy, oh boy, in the 75 hour long video that you are currently watching, um, it's easy to get lost in the mix. These are the principles modified um, appropriately. Marriage is a union that God created, therefore we should keep it together. Number two, divorce as a general rule is wrong and should not be done. Three, divorce that is unjustified coupled with remarriage is adultery. Divorce, number four, divorce that is unjustified doesn't end the, the moral obligation of the marriage. That means that you need, to, you need to go back and seek reconciliation. Number five, sexual sin can justify a divorce. Number six, sexual sin can also justify a remarriage. Number seven, staying single to better serve the Lord is a good option. Number eight, if your spouse dies, you are free to marry another. Something a lot of church fathers actually rejected. Number nine, are you the cause of unjustified divorce? Stay single or be reconciled. That's 1 Corinthians 7. Number 10, if an unbeliever wants to depart, then the believer is free from the marriage and free to remarry. 11, Jesus' rule may have exceptions not explicitly mentioned. Therefore, we can be open to unique circumstances. And this includes all the weirdness of life and stuff that you never thought of and didn't even know could happen until you heard a story. Number 12, the rule for unbelievers from 1 Corinthians 7, principle number 10, the rule for unbelievers can be applied to proclaim believers if they can be biblically treated as unbelievers, meaning they won't listen to Jesus or the church. 
13. Radical danger or harm justifies separation and possibly divorce. Um, I think it's a process, but yeah, it would eventually justify divorce. And it would be on the person because they are the one who drove you out. So the separation is on them, not you. 14. Any behavior causing proper separation can, if reconciliation is refused by the offender's continued acts properly, lead to divorce because this is, in effect, the same as the 1 Corinthians 7.15 scenario. Number 15, anyone properly free from a marriage is also free to remarry if they choose. And number 16, Christians should unilaterally fulfill, this is my last principle for us, and it's my final thought I want to give you. Christians should unilaterally fulfill our calling to serve Christ through fully obeying God's commands to husbands and or wives. Unilateral, you know what that means? You do it when they don't. That's your calling. That is your calling as a Christian. Exceptions exist, but they are abused. That's true. Um, Jesus' extreme statements get to the heart of the issue. What God has joined together, man should not separate. You should seek to follow Christ. And I again point you to my teaching on to husbands and wives individually. I really recommend. I had a couple tell me that it saved their marriage when they, uh, when they watched those videos. And I, I hope that it would bless yours. But this last principle <clears throat> that Christians should unilaterally, I'll put it up here, unilaterally fulfill our calling to serve Christ through obeying God's commands to husbands or wives. It means you change first. Breaking the cardinal rule of, 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 of American marriages, you change first. You do not require them to be good for you to be right with God. No Christian will think clearly. No Christian will think clearly about divorce until they've given over to the Lordship of Christ in their marriage. That's where you start right now. I encourage you to pray, to seek the Lord, to honor Christ with that marriage so that if you have a divorce, it is, it is um, truly uh, appropriate and proper. There are bad reasons for divorce, and I'm going to kind of add this at the end here. Here's some bad reasons to get a divorce. I'm not happy. I hate them. We've grown apart. I'm bitter. I'm just over them, and I won't change. They have repented, but I will not forgive them. Or God told me it's okay, even though it doesn't seem like it's okay to anybody who knows the Bible. God is not going to contradict himself. I'll take scripture over your impressions, and you should too. Those are obviously bad reasons for a divorce. So my conviction is that the fullness of the teaching of scripture on this topic gives us a fuller understanding that gives us um, the, the rule as well as the ability to have exceptions that are legitimate with compassion and to pick up the messy pieces of our lives and follow Christ um, moving forward. Uh, no one can say I wasn't thorough. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's about it. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed this uh, 7,000 hour long video and I hope that it's been a blessing to you and that it's helped equip you for your own life and to help others through the struggles that they're dealing with. God bless you. I really love his humility uh, as he goes through this, also talking about, he said, well, this is where I am right now. It could change. And, and I want to say the same is for me. As you learn, I am not in the same position with this topic as I was five years ago. And if I went five years before that, I, the research I did then put me in a different position as well. So we're always learning. I really, I, I actually had a couple of notes I wanted to make sure I did not forget. So I encourage you to read the references Pastor Winger talked about. We have that in our comments as well for this last session as well. So I really sincerely want you to, uh, to make the time to not just take Pastor Winger or my word for it, because basically his positions of where he was, I mean, it's just very small matters of emphasis for the most part where I would do something possibly differently. But this is basically, as the, the senior pastor of a church in the world, this is our position on this. But there, there are other God-fearing, Bible-reading, exegetically sound ministers, teachers, pastors who are out there who have a different position than where, where I am or where Pastor Winger is. So I, I really like the fact that Pastor Winger has many of these resources, which are also from folks who, who disagree with where we are at this time. So I did want to make sure I mentioned that, and I want to encourage you to, and even if we don't have references, I encourage you to listen to other sound 
biblical teachers who, and, and listen to what they say on this subject of divorce and remarriage and, and seek the Lord as the Holy Spirit to, again, give you his truth. What is true? Because we're going to keep, I know Pastor Wing and I, we're going to keep seeking after the Lord and we are definitely open to having our minds changed by scripture and by having our minds opened up to more of God's truth. Because again, this walk of sanctification, is, it's challenging, but it's beautiful because it just draws you closer and closer to the Lord. That being said, also in the links, we I am going to put the link in the comments of Pastor Winger's playlist, which includes the three hours which we've done for the past four weeks, but also has some other videos where he actually responds to some questions to this treatise that he that he did. He actually did a follow up two to three weeks later, uh, uh, addressing some questions that some of the people had after they watched everything. So I encourage you to watch that. We will have that playlist. It has a number of other things in there as well. Here is something I do want to, and Pastor Winger did mention this a little bit. I really want to emphasize that whoever you do listen to, who may have a different point of view, please make sure it's from scripture and appropriate historical documents and not based on their feelings. Uh, here's here's a couple of comments I've I've heard from Christians saying before, I don't believe God would do that. Uh, just read the Bible. If that's what he says he does, that's what he says he does. But I still have heard that. Another one I hear, I just don't feel a God of love is that mean, or I don't feel a God of love will do that. Yes, he's a God of love, and I, I, don't, I don't want to get on too much of a tangent, but we just need to read scripture. Discipline, again, it, it talks about within uh, scripture that God does discipline those that he loves. So just because we are disciplined doesn't mean he doesn't love us. And so sometimes there are consequences or what is best for us is not necessarily something that we will like at the time. Sometimes later on, we have to find that out. As we know with our parents, is sometimes our parents have disciplined us. We did not like it until years later, and then we understand it, and then we thank them for it. So anyway, that comes to the end of, again, our four-week session on divorce and remarriage. I hope this was helpful. We are now going to move on and starting in Matthew 5.33, we will move on to the next one, the fourth antithesis. I'm not going to tell you what it is. You've got to come back next week to actually see it. So before I say goodbye, I always want to say, hey, hey if you're visiting us for the first time and whatever something was said during this service that has moved your heart where you believe Jesus is God and you want to give your life to him. There are no special words you need to do. You just need to acknowledge, admit you are a, you have sinned against the holy God and you believe that Jesus is God and you are willing to serve him as your Lord and King for the rest of your life. Okay. You, you're going to lay your life down. You're giving your life up. It's one of the things called the beautiful exchange for that. And you commit your life to him. In your own words, there's nothing special that you have to do. And if you, if the Lord has brought you to that, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. And I encourage you that if you know some friends or family members who love the Lord, who are seeking after the Lord sincerely, call them up, contact them right away, right now. Please do that so they can help guide you on the next steps to take. Now, if you don't know anyone like that, you don't have any, ugh, I can't talk today, have any friends or family members who actually are seeking after the Lord, please contact us at info at or ACIW.org and you can click the contact us 
piece each one either way is fine i do not mind either way you want to do it so if you are able to do that contact us we will then help you step by step on what you need to do next so hopefully i will see you here next week at a church in the world where we coach people for the glory of god have a great rest of your week